Hi everyone, this is Howard this week. Uh, Jeff's away, so welcome. I'm going to have Seth start this week. So Seth, there you go. Uh, uh, there we go. Good. Um, uh, so a couple cases. This one is happened when I was out of town, which I thought was a, this is a very interesting case. So uh, we could see that there's this strange vein here, um, and if you follow it down, it's actually connecting to so all of the left pulmonary veins connect to the structure. Additionally, there's an accessory right middle lobe pulmonary vein connecting to the structure that then goes up and then drains into the brachiocephalic vein. So that's kind of like an extra cardiac portion of a, well, it's a partial anomalous pulmonary venous return. Then there's the right superior pulmonary vein, which drains up here um, into, and then you follow it down, drains into the SVC. So that's three of the four veins are anomalous and have a um, shunt from the, instead of going to the left atrium, or going back to the right. And what's interesting, fascinating about this, so there's one vein here, it's quite large. And then the question is, well, what's this vein doing? It's going into the left atrium. There, There is a, a large, I would call this an inferior sinus venosus ASD, the septum, if you look at it on the four chamber, um, the septum secundum is, at least in my impression, um, is intact, as is the primum, um, and that the defect is really along the inferior aspect. What's interesting is that we have this additional bridge of tissue here, which is a um, basically like a cortrite triatum. Now, I'm not really sure um, if this defect is complete or not. My guess is that it's it's not complete up superiorly. But what's interesting is that the right inferior pulmonary vein, which is this dominant vein, that the one that actually goes into the left atrium, still drains to the, so the, the you know, the classic uh, sinistrum uh, cortriatriatum divides the, um, the left atrium into two chambers, one that receives the pulmonary veins and the other which has the left atrial appendage and atrial ventricular valve plane. So this one's a little more displaced, but nonetheless, you can see that there's this pulmonary vein, but it goes in on the side opposite of the triatriatum. And then, so the question is, we're not really sure which way this vein is directed. If the, if the flow is actually directed from the left atrium into the right atrium through the inferior sinus venosus because of this band here, or if it's unattached enough to where it's still getting into the left atrium. But it's it's almost like a a very I mean it's a it's three out of four veins are definitely going the wrong way and the question is is this one being shunted the wrong way and is it some very strange at some level some very strange TAPVR um, anyways I, I thought this was an absolutely fascinating case uh, you can see the right heart's way too big and hypertrophied there was no there was no VSD or anything so uh, a weird PAPVR verging on a TAPVR because of a, a cortriatriatum or at least uh, an atrial septal band or an atrial band. Um, wow. To follow up on that, this was a interesting case from a couple of years ago. Um, and here, I know, oh, I thought I had better images than this, but this is a TAPVR. And um, we can see all of our cardiac veins coming across. So this is actually another TAPVR with a big ASD and a big VSD. What was interesting about this was that the um, IVC 
actually drains into the left atrium here. So it was just this is just another. So the question is, is it really a TAPVR if when they all come down and they all drain into the IVC, it should be an infracardiac TAPVR. But if that infracardiac, if that IVC then drains into the left atrium, which this does, and it is anatomic left atrium. I have better pictures. I don't know. I can't remember which ones are good. Is that technically a TAPVR or not? Um, and they were labeling this as a TAPVR, even though it technically didn't lead to issues because the IVC dra drained into the wrong chamber. Because uh, the IVC drained into the left atrium instead of the right atrium. Mm -hmm. So just another weird congenital case, wow. uh, which we see plenty of. And then uh, this is just a pretty case we had the other day that we finally got path confirmation on. Not that we really needed it. Uh, but this is a guy who has upper lobe predominant, you know, young guy, 39 years old, upper lobe predominant cystic change, you know, may be confused for emphysema, but just too cystic looking. Um, had an open lung biopsy, which confirmed um, end stage kind of PLCH. What's interesting now is that he is waiting transplant, but because he's a Jehovah's Witness, they're trying to figure out how to get him somewhere that will transplant him. Our, our surgeons won't, even though we do a lot of a lot of transplants, they won't transplant this guy um, if he refuses to take blood, which he won't. So they're trying. There's, I guess, there's a a place in Texas that will do it. So they're trying to arrange transfer him to, to a hospital in Texas that's willing to do a transplant on him um, without, you know, without the possibility of getting blood, which I don't know how you guarantee that, but maybe, I guess. Maybe he can bank his own blood. What? Do you ever have these people bank their own blood? Yeah, I'm not sure. Honestly, I was just told this today that he was a Jehovah's Witness. I, I'm not, and that they're waiting for transfer to Texas. I, I don't know what the rules are. I mean, that makes sense to just get your own blood and do it. Maybe, maybe that's one one option they're looking into. Um, but I was told that they're planning on move, shipping him to Texas. But it, you know, your your point's valid. I mean, I, I think you're right. You could probably take his blood over a couple of weeks and have enough for in case something goes wrong. Um, and then. This is actually, this is a cool case uh, that I forgot that I had, which, you know, I, so uh, we, we talk a lot about Monier Coons, and, and we see these very large patulous esophagus, uh, sorry, trachea, tracheas and, you know, smokers, and we always wonder, this is actually, you know, a very massive trachea, and very nice, because we get, you know, involvement of the central airways as well. Um, and this is actually, you know, Monier Kuhn has a striking male predominance. It's the, the literature says 19 to 1. Again, I, that's just what the literature says. Um, and you get the central bronchiectasis up to a point. Now, over time, I think if they say fourth order bronchi, you can get bronchiectasis up to, but supposedly. Well, not supposedly. It can, you can get much worse bronchiectasis farther out because of repeated infections, um, and so you're supposed to use, in, depending on if it's a man or a woman, different sizes of the trachea and different sizes of her bronchi. Um, but nonetheless, this is a case of of Monier Coons and, and a young female. So again, most almost all the cases or every case, the first female I've seen that has been involved. You can just see these very comparatively, not the not the greatest thin slices, but just monstrous. Is, um, is, is Williams Campbell in the differential when you get um, this dilation out to the fourth fourth order of bronchi? Is that something uh, we should consider? So Williams Campbell, Williams Campbell should not, from my understanding, affect the trachea and the main stem bronchi. Okay. So that that is my understanding, that Williams Campbell is supposed to be fourth fourth generation on, and, um, you know, you can get past that in patients with Monier-Kuhn because they get repeated infections, 
and you can get dilation. And of course, the issue is with so little of these, we, we label these as something, you know, she has a, a trachea that meets criteria, she has main stem bronchi that meets criteria, her lungs look like it, but we never get path. You know, this is, you know, this is, um, you know, we very rarely get path confirming, right? It's a mitochondrial, I think they said they finally found it's a mitochondrial issue to, to finally find out which elastic fiber is, we just assume it based on the imaging. Um, but I, I don't know, I, I, I've only seen one or two cases of Williams Campbell, but from my understanding, it spares the trachea. I don't know if anyone else has any other insights into that. And how old is she, Yusuf? She's like 24. Okay. Feels strange. Young. Yeah, she's, uh, I don't have the age on here. Maybe she's 29. No, she is, uh, right, because most people present actually in their 40s. And again, the vast majority are men. Um, and uh, so, so definitely a strange case. I mean, do you guys have other thoughts? I mean, that's her... That's, That's her ongoing diagnosis. I'm really impressed by the extent to which the bronchi are dilated, but if you look for a bronchial wall between the lumen of bronchus and parenchyma, you don't they're see not thick. They're not thickened at all. In fact, no. they're imperceptible. So the they idea are. that those bronchial walls are super thin. Right. Yeah. It's really interesting. No, they are it, it, it is. And I mean, this could be some other entity. Yeah. Um, I wonder if she has some weird entity that is kind of um, hits the elastin of structures and they sort of just melt away and dilate. The walls get very thin and dilate. That's so interesting. Yeah, I mean, because that, that's the I mean, the the primary deficiency in in, in Munir Kuhn is is a you know the elastic fibers are defective and don't work and that leads to the dilation um, if she has another sort of anomaly that's similar I mean she has no other problems anywhere else yeah in her history she doesn't have any other signs or problems well, um, syndrome or connective tissue disorder mm. or wow well, nothing else very young to have the, the couple the, the couple cases of alpha one antitrypsin that we've seen affect the airways they don't they're not usually this thin are they the, the airway walls they're thick yeah and again I, I mean this you know for a young woman you know the trachea and you know there's measurements people use uh, three three for a man is supposed to be the upper limits of normal her she was over three in some areas and her main stem bronchi were almost 2.8 in some places which is massive um, but we're going to find out because they're going to, I think they're going to uh, do a lung transplant on her. I don't know how much that's going to help, or they're working her up because she's so symptomatic. But I, again, I don't know if that's actually going to solve her problem or not. So maybe we can actually get path proof or something. One could imagine that if you put a bronchoscope in there and had her breathe out, that the airways would just collapse because they have no strength. Yeah, so Right, yeah, Monier Coons has a, it, almost all of them are, are tracheomalacic as well. Um, it's like 80, 85% have uh, severe tracheomalacia as well. So, uh, yeah, I, I'm going to, I'll try to look in her history more and follow up. And uh, it's just the diagnosis she carries. Um, and, you know, she just came here recently. Jeez. So those are uh, those are my four cases for the day. Great, those are really great. Nice. Yeah. All right, I'm gonna switch over to Travis. You there still? See, yeah. Unless Brent wants to go first, I know he was gonna see if he could show us up. Uh, I I'm here. I I can. Um... If you, if you want to, if you guys are too busy, I'm happy to, to go. Oh, no, I'm actually to the point where I'm having trouble finding a station that works now, so this is perfect. <laughs> okay, let me see. Okay, now I can't see the window. Yep, I can see you. Uh, let's see. I, 
I'm having trouble seeing the window here. Let me figure out what's going on. Okay, let me see here. Okay, now I can see it. Okay, th this is really, uh, this is a, uh, can you see that now? Yes. Okay, uh, this is really the most dramatic um, chest wall, um, you know, hematoma. Uh, I'll just cut to the chase that I've seen ever. <laughs> and uh, this is a patient, um, you know, in, in the uh, early 50s, I believe, who um, had a, um, Meat uh for uh, uh, cabbage and had a saphenous vein graft to the PDA and had a um, another um, uh, had a lima to the LED and presented with um, a ton of chest wall uh, swelling here and you can see just the extensive collection throughout the entire um, chest wall here and um, you know with a lot of stranding high attenuation material there's a drain there. Um, so th this case just came to me two days ago. I didn't know about it at this time. Um, this was a couple weeks ago. And they uh, drained this. They debrided it. Um, they uh, um, explored um, uh, the chest a bit. And so this is what the patient looks like as of two days ago. And um, the, uh, there was a referral to um, one of the IR people here to potentially try to embolize something. Um, that was a bleeder, you know, was it in the chest wall bleeder, what was going on? So just in looking at this, you can see the cause of the bleed, which I think is the most interesting part of this. You can see here is a, uh, um, a vein graft here to the, the left circulation, and you can see that there is a lima here, and you can follow those down. Um, nothing much going on with those, um, but if you look here anteriorly, here's a PDA graft, and let's follow that down. Um, and you can see it going down here. There's some stranding, some blood there. Um, and right there, that's abnormal. So you can see there's a little uh, blip of, of contrast that looks like a pseudoaneurysm uh, right there, if not active extravasation at that, at that point. Let me show you the uh, sagittal here. Um, and at this point, everyone was kind of gathering around um, the screen. And you can see that there was the native, but here's the, the, the venous bypass graft here. You can see right at that that point right there, that's a little pseudoaneurysm uh, that I told them about. And they um, you know, they went back in. I, I gave them some some reformats here, looking at the pseudoaneurysm there. Um, and they did, in fact, they did selective uh, angiography of that and found um, area of extra, active extravasation there of the mid graft and placed a covered stent um, over that. So uh, just a very interesting case of, and, and the additional history that I didn't, I had to go back and dig for at the time is that they did an exploration of the mediastinum after that first CT and they found a small um, area of bleeding, um, presumably within the, the graft, and then they thought they repaired that, so, or they tried to repair that. Obviously, you know, something went wrong with that and um, this is what was remaining. Um, so anyway, I just thought that was a great good case of a, a severe, um, you know, very large hematoma here, larger than I've ever seen um, in a pseudoaneurysm. Did they remove the tsunami wires, Brent? <clears throat> did they leave the tsunami wires or did they have to take them out too? Well, they, they, they took them out. I mean, this is, this is around the time of the, uh, um, uh, the exploration and um, not sure actually what the timing was. I think they removed them. Uh, you know, maybe the day before this, this CT, but um, that's, you know, they, at some point they had to remove those. And so, you think the astronomy wire that injured that vessel is so anterior? It, it may have been. It's unclear to me whether it was actually a nick during the procedure or it was, um, you know, uh, part of the, the astronomy wires here or even, you know, a sternal fragment itself that, that sheared it a bit, but, um, uh -huh. yeah. But yeah, um, when did just, that, uh, it's, when did that occur? That? Relation, sorry, when did that occur in relation to the cabbage? When did she present with all this? Th this was this was um, I believe a week after the cabbage. About a week later. Uh, with increasing, uh, you know, so it's a little bit weird timing because you'd think it would happen just you know uh, shortly after. Uh, but I believe that was a little bit of a delayed presentation about a week after. Oh. So, um, 
here's another. It, it's just a coincidence that I have this uh, case loaded up. Let me let me bring it up here. Um, oops. Okay. Um, this is a um, 80 year old patient, and uh, I promise I didn't confer with uh, Seth about these cases, but 80-year-old um, patient, and the most interesting thing here about this case is actually the symptomatology of this patient, which was actually uh, none <laughs> or very little, and you can see that there is um, tracheomegaly and there is, uh, you know, um, bronchomegaly, uh, there is, um, you know, multiple orders of bronchi are involved here. Uh, this case, additionally, you know, you have some higher order bronchi involved than you would otherwise think of in 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 Morning or Coon. Um, but let's take a look at the you know very very distended and irregular bronchi and um, and trachea, and you know this has the typical uh, appearance on the sagittal. Um, can you see the sagittal? I'm trying to. Yeah, that's kind of yeah, you can. I think you should see it. Um, look on the sagittal. You can see this very very irregular um, trachea. Yeah, with all these kind of diverticular, pseudo diverticula, um, and uh, just so interesting that you know this looks like it's Mornier Coon, and um, but this gentleman really had never had, uh, to his uh, recollection, you know, um, repeated bouts of, of pneumonia or infection. He wasn't even really, which I find striking, it wasn't really bothered by a cough at all. Um, so this is kind of the most dramatic, you know, kind of tracheomegaly case that I've seen that is not really accompanied by symptoms. Um, you can see all of these small airways nodules, trained by nodules everywhere, and mucoid impaction, and you can even wonder if he has a little, you know, some infection in bronchioles here. So um, just very curious to me that he was not really symptomatic and has not reportedly been symptomatic. So um, I don't know. I, I find that to be, honestly, most of the cases I see are completely incidental findings. There are people who are not symptomatic. They're not, you know, it's, I, I don't know why that is. I, and I've seen cases like this and like worse where it's, they're, they're not complaining of a cough or fever or repeated infections. And it, it, it's, it's interesting. I, I don't. Yeah. I wonder, Seth, have you noticed, have you noticed Seth, that um, some of the, because ma many of these patients uh, or at least a significant proportion, um, you know, that we have smoke. And it seems like yeah. the uh, the smokers, the smokers, you know, as you expect, tend to have more symptoms, um, you know. But it, but, but is, you know, that's interesting that you're finding that. And I mean, some, a lot of the ones that we've seen have had a history of recurrent ICU infections, and I mean, stays with infection and so forth. So, um, but it's interesting that you've seen a significant proportion that just haven't had. No, um, completely. I'm telling you, at the VA, I swear, we we see, you know, when I'm over there one a month that not not with the the peripheral bronchiectasis as, as bad as this but with just these massive patchless trachea and central airways that technically meet criteria and you wonder is it really the same process or is it a you know just the form fruits or some lesser variant of it that are completely asymptomatic um yeah yeah I, um, and that gentleman was 80, and so I found that interesting. This this uh, person is um, is is um, is um, uh, 40 and has this just massive trachea, um, yeah. mucoid pathogen, yeah. just really really dilated um, airways everywhere, um, bronchi, and and going into the distal order bronchi, which I find uh, interesting. And but th this person had had a history of infections. Um, you know that um, you know we're we're ongoing and, and recurrent infections, and you can see a little bit of the, the corrugated appearance there. But but this was just a really uh, another you know one that just came in in that same period of time over the last week of uh, dramatic um, uh, you know presumably more near coon here. So this is a water girl. It's a lot of breast tissue. Um, I, I think this would that was. Um, uh, some uh, gynecomastia there. Uh, let me just take a look here again. I believe, I apologize that I'm a little, I'll just, I'll double check, but I, I believe that's, that's uh, you know, some, some gynecomastia there. So, okay. sorry I'm a little discombobulated this week because of some technical issues with our reading room. <laughs> um, just want to show one, one more Let's see. So this is just one uh, courtesy of uh, 
Art Stillman, and uh, just a cute case, nothing dramatic, but um, this is a patient who's in um, the That's uh, inner 50s. Right. Oh, let me uh, let me uh, get that up here. Let's see. Okay, okay. Um, this yep. is a patient who's uh, you know mi middle aged patient who has this um, pattern here within the lungs. It's a train bud uh, cluster pattern. Uh, some branching uh, nodularity here. Looks like it could well be you know some sort of bronchiolitis, um, maybe a, a a chronic MAC infection. Um, and look here, he thought Travis would like this particularly because here we have uh, some caseous necrosis, some uh, cheesy uh, MAC of the mitral annulus, mitral annular calcification. So this is really MAC times two potentially, or uh, <laughs> as he wanted to call it, a, a cheesy MAC. <laughs> so That's what do we want to call attack. it? The MAC attack, um, I, I'm sure we could come up with a lot of different permutations, but um, he just thought Travis would enjoy that especially. So, but uh, that, that's all I have this week. Now, just, just like a free hypertrophy left ventricle, was there a cardiomyopathy here, or is that, is that not thick? I believe it was just a, I believe it was just, just thick, you know, from hypertension and, so, yeah. And the patient doesn't have a malignancy such that, those things could be a vascular tree and bud pattern from metastases, just by the way? Right. It uh, doesn't, to our knowledge, um, you know, we've, we've had a rash of, uh, you know, I, I'm saving cases. I must have like 30, 40 cases now of saved of intravascular metastatic disease, and many of them are just from the last uh, couple months. <laughs> it's, uh, that's, that's right. I mean, it's, it's uh, no, we don't know of any malignancy here. Hmm. Wow. So anyway, that's all I have. Great, thanks. Yeah. Travis, hey, hey Howard. Okay? Howard, can you go back to uh, can you show my screen real quick? Oh yeah. All yeah. right, just for a second. So I, I lied about that woman with the when you're a coon. So this is what I found in her. She had a, just just had a detailed genetic workup. So she has joint hyperextensibility. Um, multiple episodes of pneumonia, uh, whatever the, this thing, but she's had ptosis, multiple abnormal brain MRI lesions, muscular atrophy of her left uh, face. Um, she had a connective tissue panel was negative. She had a, they did do an alpha-1 antitrypsin and a sweat test and all that were negative. And she has all these kind of strange genetic mutations. So they actually did a biopsy and a electron microscopy over tracheal mucosa and didn't see anything abnormal, although they said that the submucosa and elastic fibers weren't well seen. So um, right. they just didn't see anything because it was all thinned out. Yeah, th well they said they saw like some the cilia looked okay, but beyond that they really didn't get a good submucosa and I think it's because the the uh when they were doing the biopsies it was so thin they were afraid to really take big chunks. But she does have some sort of genetic, she's not normal otherwise. Yeah. So who, who, who knows maybe what the cause of that was. Yeah, maybe so just maybe, not yet described disorder that's associated with the last life. So they yeah, I don't, I mean, does Ehlers-Danlos, did Ehlers-Danlos ever cause bron like tracheobronchiomegaly? I mean, I know you can get some airway stuff, but I don't know of it like that. It's on, anyway, it's on the list. Of, it's on the list of things that causes some bronchitis, but I've never seen a, a case that looked like Marner Kuhn that was actually Ehlers Danlos. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So but she's I, probably I, just, I just got some weird genetic something. Yeah. I just checked. I just checked on that that patient with a severe uh, tracheal bronchomegaly, and and it is a male with um with male with gynecomastia, so not a female. Okay. Huh. All right. Travis, still there? Yeah, I'm here. Okay. I'm ready. Good. You see a CT Good. image? Mm -hmm. This is a, a case that came in a couple of weeks ago, and this was a CT that I saw. This is a lady who is, I think, in her upper 80s, and she presented with bright red blood per rectum. It was found to have a large uh, colon, or 
rectosigmoid colon cancer and adenocarcinoma that was subsequently biopsied. Uh, and this was study was being done for evaluation for metastatic disease. And you'll see that she has not one but two thrombi. And this is a late enough phase where this is clearly not just flow and incomplete opacification. And so we, my fellow and I commented on this and we called the team and told them she had known atrial fibrillation and wasn't on anticoagulation because of her rectal bleeding from her cancer. And this was on the 14th, as you see, and she went to the OR on the 15th, had her colon resected, and then on the 16th, 16th woke up aphasic and had a an left-sided hemiparesis, or sorry, right-sided hemiparesis. And you'll see on her neck CT angiogram that you'll lose her, her internal carotid here and it's, I think most, a lot of this area is slow flow, but as you go into the cavernous portion, you see that you have no flow in it. And then up higher, you see that we get, you get reconstitution right here. So suspected a big embolic infarct. And sure enough, this, our, our next CTs always start down at the heart and you will see that the, that little embolism or that little thrombus that was present posteriorly is no longer there. And this was in the course of two days. Oui. And so this, so here you see where that, where it should be in the posterior part of the left atrium, no longer there on the follow-up uh, neck CT. So we had called and talked to them and, and you know, documented, because I was getting nervous at first that this had happened, you know, that somehow communication had broke down, but it, it, I didn't know her history of a colon cancer, but it turns out she couldn't be anticoagulated because of her big mass, but this Wait, which, is her, which, is, which is her first study? Sorry, this one is the first study, the one on the, okay. on the right. Yeah. And, the, it, sec and the, the second study? Two days later, this was the part of the next yeah. CT angiogram. Now that, that, so, so that's that, interesting. So do you think the, because uh, on that second study, you know, you the, the yeah, posterior yeah. stuff is clearly gone, but yeah, the anterior stuff looks just like non-filling. Yeah, well, I don't know if this if this little rim. No, that. Thrombus, yeah. On the first one, it's clearly thrombus. Yeah. On the second one, I would. You know. I, I don't. Yeah. Right. You're saying right here. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know if this is, if it's all just mixing or if some of this laminar thrombus is still you there. No, there's probably some of it still the, there. I'm just saying yeah. if you had that with de novo. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I would have not called. I would have probably chalked this up to filling. I think is what you're trying to imply. Without yeah, the, yeah. So it's amazing. Yeah. It's good you had the prior because I would have not. Yeah. Yeah, but just bad situation, and and she had a massive stroke. She went to neuro IR. They they did an embolectomy, and she still had horrible symptoms afterwards. So given her cancer and and her old age, she was sent home on hospice. But it's the first time I've actually caught it. You know because. I hate seeing these because you never know what to do, and you feel like you're inconveniencing the clinician when you call and say that there's thrombus. But clearly, these can eject themselves at any time, as we see here. So, so I, Travis, in terms yeah. of the the non-filling, the um, the next CT is actually more in the levo phase. It's later on. So, wouldn't you have expected some no, I, some filling no, by I that? This point? Is, this should be a CT angiogram, so I think it's pretty early, actually. But if that, you look um, at the pulmonary, compare yeah. the pulmonary artery filling of this with your previous... I, I, yes, I think it's probably because it was a, sh a smaller dose that they may have chased, because here you just have pretty uniform filling of everything. This was part of a chest, abdomen, and pelvis study in more of a, a delayed phase. Yeah, it's, that's probably like a 70, 60, 70 yeah. second delay. Where and I first, think it's probably, yeah, 70 or... Yeah, and it's probably a 75 cc injection in the neck and 125 cc's for the chest, abdomen, and pelvis, or something like that. So let's play devil's advocate. What do you do? What do you do when you see the study on the left and it's your first study? The, this study, no. the, ne that, the next. That's study. your first study. It's a it's a it's a regular patient, or even if it's an AFib patient. What, what do you the do? First thing I, the first thing I do when I see this is I curse, and usually I curse out loud because I don't because I'm just frustrated because I don't know what to do with these, and usually yep. I chalk it up to to yep. slow flow and stasis, and even on on trans esophageal echo, 
they can have difficulty differentiating slow flow from thrombus in the appendage. And it's funny, there was this article that just came out, anyways, it's a total different issue, talking about confirming thrombus in the left atrial appendage via transthoracic echo, which to me is like using a crappier, crappier study to confirm your <laughs> less, you know. What? Did you say transthoracic echo? Yeah, they used to transfer. It was this thing talking about um, left atrial appendage thrombus in tabby patient, TAVR patients, and they used. Um, I thought it was transthoracic. Maybe it was transesophageal echo, but still, they have trouble differentiating the smoke from slow flow. Yeah, yeah. From thrombus, um, and I never know whether just to tell them to bring the patient back or just say it's likely this. It's well. I know, and Brent's probably still on there, that when I was at Emory, we were having issues with the, the TAVR studies because we would have this incomplete filling. And every time they went to do the procedure, they never found anything. So we started doing you know, the gated arterial and then doing more of a delay through the rest of the body, including the heart, to get the runoff vessels so that you had more time to fill it in. Yeah, but, we, yeah, it's it's a real pain. So for AFib cases, we started occasionally, it doesn't happen all the time, doing a very low dose, 80 kV, just quick shot at 50 seconds or like 60 seconds to see if it fills in mm -hmm. because it just happens all the time, but we never know what to do with it. Yeah, and, and maybe when you have the more anterior thrombus, it's less prone to embolize than that stuff posteriorly. I don't know. Yeah. Um, hey, Trevor? Yeah. Tre Trevor? Uh, that, that's an interesting point because I was just uh, wanting to ask you um, if you'd seen anything about the um, the location of the thrombus or the um, morphology of the atrial appendage, as in like this one looks like kind of a cauliflower type, and yeah, you know, the, it just it's only the cases I've seen embolized to like cause renal infarcts and things like that have been more of that like kind of cauliflower appearance, and and they have had like some posterior. Uh, Thrombus. So I think you might be onto something. It's hard to say, but it's it's an interesting question. Yeah, I, I don't know. I haven't had a chance to to look into the different morphologies. I know my former fellow Nick Burris is watching, who's at Michigan now, and he was the uh, morphology expert, could differentiate the cauliflower from the chicken wing and the cactus and all those other silly <laughs> morphologies. So maybe so maybe <laughs> maybe he knows, but uh. Yeah, no, it's an interesting thought. Yeah, morphology, they don't know what they mean. Okay. All right, well, this case, this one is a follow-up. Well, this, as you'll see, this is a, a TAVR complication with an extra complication. So this is a, these are the, my favorite types of cases. So this is a patient who had his TAVR done elsewhere, and this is a, I think this is a core valve. You can see it looks like a core. I, I I'll preface this by saying he's had two prior median sternotomies for one failed mitral valve replacement and then a redo a few years ago. And I think that was originally from or for endocarditis. And I don't I don't have the any of the preoperative imaging, so I don't know what the deal was with his with his TAVR. And this was done, you can see there's a, a pseudoaneurysm and there's a little communication at the I think the, the neck is here at the distal aspect of the, the TAVR. And this was done on the 6th of February, and they brought him in because they were considering doing an off-label use of an, of, an, of an aortic stent to cover this. I think one of the reasons that he's probably at less risk of rupture, of frank rupture, is just that he's had two median sternotomies and has a lot of adhesions, which is good for him. But then he came back this earlier this week, and I saw this study. This was to follow up the pseudoaneurysm. And the good news is the pseudoaneurysm is is unchanged in overall size, and, and the portion that's enhancing is actually a little bit smaller. But as I was scrolling down through, I noticed this, which was new. So this is like the case that Brent showed recently of thrombus associated with the, the TAVR. And you can see it along both the left coronary cusp and along the non-coronary cusp. And the non-coronary sinus, the portion outside of the, of the stent really has a lot of thrombus in it too. And the that New England Journal article repeated or reported a varying incidence of restricted valve leaflet motion and, and thrombus on these patients, and they, you know, most of them responded to anticoagulation. But of course, him, he's a management dilemma because he has a contraindication to anticoagulation in the sense that he has a pseudoaneurysm. But you probably want to anticoagulate 
to prevent his risk of embolic stroke. So they did admit him there, cautiously anticoagulating him. Like I said, I don't think he's going to rupture just because he has all these adhesions, but this is a, a twofer with uh, AR, with TAVR complications here. Hmm. So this, on the first this one, the first, can you, I'm sorry, can you scroll down on the first one? Yeah, you know, there's a, maybe, I mean, maybe those leaflets are a little thick. Is that what you were wondering? Yeah, yeah. I, I, actually, no, I, it was, never mind, it was, that called me, but it was actually just the mitral, the anterior leaf of the mitral valve was thick. I thought oh, might have, that might have been yeah. part of a thrombus, but that's just the, the thickened leaf. From, valve. Right, from the, from the valve prosthesis. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So, yeah, so we will, so he's being anticoagulated now. The, that New England Journal article didn't find a statistically significant risk or uh, risk for TIAs and strokes in these patients, although there was a little trend. It just didn't reach significance. So, but they are anticoagulating him now. And then, so I thought that case was cool. And then this was the very next case that I, um, let me find it. The very next case that I saw with the same, reading out with the same resident. I didn't think we could top that one. Um, but we have this patient. And you can see he's got a right-sided aortic arch. He's got some funky anatomy that I'll talk about in a second. He's in his 50s and is a patient who's not from the United States and has an uncorrected tetralogy of Fallot with uh, pulmonary atresia, as you can see here. And this was palliated with a, you know, I don't know. If you have a right-sided arch, I, I guess it's off the ascending aorta. Even though it's going to the left pulmonary artery, I guess it's technically a Waterston shunt. Regardless of whether it's a Waterston or a Potts shunt, you know, it's a it's a systemic to pulmonary arterial shunt. And I think he's got a really wimpy little native left or right pulmonary artery here. And you can see he's got a bunch of, of these, these MAPCAs or major aorta pulmonary collaterals going to both of his lungs. And one of them has even been stented, as you, or a couple of them have been stented. There's a little drug-eluting stent that they placed in here. And this study was done shortly after he had had a dental procedure and presented with stroke uh, and, and, had a, and, and had a stroke presumably related to infection from his dental procedure. So this was an outside study, and then a month later wait, he had this. Wait, I'm confused. Yeah. So they did all this stuff, but they didn't repair his VSD? No. They did not repair his VSD because he didn't get he didn't get the Waterston until he was in his like 30s, 20s or 30s. Okay. So as an adult, yeah. And it looks like does, does he have a residual BT? Does he have a BT? Up? Is it, I don't no, know. That, I thought or is no. That just I thought, a stent? I, this is, is just thing a down? stent. Yeah, this thing. Yeah, is that like a little BT or yeah. is that? This is no. This is one of the several stents that they put in. Okay. Okay. And I don't have a prior to this, but apparently some of this, some of this is eccentric thrombus in his left pulmonary artery, which I would say is in situ thrombus. But this next study is interesting, and this was done here in November around the time of Thanksgiving, because he now has clot in these MAPCAs. Yeah. You can see here. But what's really cute is this one. He has a little saddle embolus in two of these or three of these major aorta pulmonary collaterals here. <laughs> and <laughs> so so they're trying to say that these are somebody was saying that he had DBT. I, I don't know if I buy that these are are from an a, a leg vein source, even though they kind of look like it. You know, they, they would have had to go cross his BSD into his L V somehow, you know, out here and catch on those in the descending aorta. I don't know or if it's just in situ thrombus that formed in one of these stents and then propagated like that. I have no freaking idea what happened, but this was the follow-up okay. I saw. If it was DVT, it's pretty lucky that's all where that's the only place it yeah, went, right. the stents. But they anticoagulated him and all the thrombus is, is gone from these from his MAPCAs. So I don't know where it came from. I don't know. I'm still, but I partially I'm biased. I think that, I think we see a lot more in situ thrombus in, in any PE studies than we usually give credit for, but that's a different story. And he still has this eccentric thrombus here. So, I don't know. We so, just had a great, we just had a, a mate, I didn't show it, but two days ago, a 50-something year old unrepaired with just the craziest map goes from another yeah. country, just 
I, I mean, everywhere. But I'm not seeing. I don't think I've seen a Waterson Cooley shunt before. Honestly, I don't. I don't think I've ever seen one. That's. Could I could yeah. I ask you guys a, a a question about Watchman device? I think Howard showed one a, a few weeks ago. Have you guys seen them in place and seen CTs on them? Yeah, and I think Brent showed me one one time. Okay. What so, is? I don't know which device that is. Which device is that? This that's is a, a. That's one of. Or, it's a left atrial oh, yeah. it like occlusion device that they put in. It's kind of like an umbrella, and it sort of yeah, fills yeah, yeah. Up. Okay, yeah, yeah. We we do those. Okay. So um, I don't have an example to show you guys, but I did see a CT on one last week, and there was a thick band along the edge of this thing, along the medial edge against the body of the left atrium, uh, that was not opacified with contrast. So I just and I couldn't see, you know, the the metal device of this thing is actually very very thin and you know you just see a, a few little wires you don't see much in the way of radio opaque structure to it but there was this big thick band and I just wondered if that is a normal finding or whether that was a layer of thrombus that had formed over the surface of this thing mm -hmm. um, does that make any sense I'm sorry I don't have an example to show you up I could pull it next week yeah I would, I would have thought that the contrast would have gone right up to the metal elements that you could see in this device no, Unless it had just been there for a long time and had some sort of endothelial overgrowth. Too. Well, there's, there's, they are supposed to endothelialize and uh, you know and stuff like that, but it seemed to me that that should be a thin layer. What, rather than speculate, I'll just uh, I'll show it next time and you yeah. guys can help me with it. And the other question I wanted to ask cardiovascular wise, we there's a person here who has a HeartMate two in place, and somehow they have placed a stent in the efferent limb, the one that's going to the ascending aorta from this device. Have you ever seen a stent placed inside the efferent limb of a of a heartmate uh, LVAD? In the outflow cannula for some reason? No. That's right. In the proximal outflow cannula near the connector to the to the metallic uh, body of no. the no, no, but I can imagine know. them doing it. I can understand why they would do it if it was thrombosing. Um, and they couldn't control it, but I, I've, or they had a lot of insight to that kind of granulation tissue forms, but I've okay. not seen that. Okay, well, I'll bring that one next time too. Yeah, show it. Okay, I'm curious to see. It. Okay, yeah, I am too, Howard. That's I'm, I've got plenty more, but I want to save you some time if you've got cases you want to okay. show. Okay, I'll, I'll show a couple for the last bit. Okay. Okay, this one is uh, just kind of cute, and you'll see in a moment why I chose to show it today. So this is a person with known primary alveolar proteinosis. Here's a chest radiograph, and here is a corresponding coronal image, and just super typical features of alveolar proteinosis and crazy paving. So some of you know that in the last two weeks I was in Tanzania in some of the northern parks, including the Serengeti. And what we did, which is really nice, is we did some walking with rangers in the Serengeti. So typically you walk out and they have two guides, they have rifles with them, but you walk in the bush and that's really neat. So of course, when I came across this, I had to label it Serengeti Crazy Paving. So this is my Serengeti crazy paving, and I think it's a really nice example of it. So obviously this is a, just a, a mud hole, a dried mud hole, and I don't know what footprints are right there, but otherwise I thought it's just a nice example of crazy paving, I decided. So that's my Serengeti crazy paving case. Okay, this one um, we saw some time ago. At the time that I saw the CT, it was a couple of days after the event. So here's the trauma case, and there's your bedside chest radiograph, and here is the CT, and there's a bunch of trauma-related stuff. And when I looked at this, I said, oh, yeah, okay, and looked to see whether it had been mentioned, which it hadn't. So 
a description of the pneumothorax and so on. But this is, in my view, a really typical case of traumatic rupture of pericardial membranes with the so-called empty pericardial sac sign, where the space should be occupied by the heart, but the heart has come out of the pericardium. And if you look at the orientation of the heart, how it's rotated here looking uh, clockwise, and here's the uh, ventricle, really typical for the entity of transpericardial herniation. So um, at that point, I called them and talked to them because I saw that from the clinical notes that he had had intermittent episodes of substantial hypotension. And that really got me interested because that's one of the dilemmas here or one of the things that may happen. It may be a cause of instant death or profound hypotension, presumably due to relative constriction maybe here and diminished blood flow through pulmonary veins, through the heart and so on. And by the way, some of this was called pneumomediastinum, but it isn't. The area is definitely in the pericardial recesses. So to make a long story short, they decided that at that time, because his hypotension seemed to be less of a problem, and he had some other injuries, including a brain injury, that they were just going to leave this alone. And they decided not to, to pursue it any further. So he was actually discharged. They said that even if he's got this big pericardial membrane defect, it's not constricting the heart, and we're just going to leave it alone. So I'm pretty sure, in my view, that that's what he has. Well, that was a gutsy decision. Yeah. I picked up some articles, and you know, here's one that um, Mark Gosson and those guys um, reported. And one of the ones they showed in their article was a person that looked like this in whom, and I think it's this guy. And because he, too, had a presumed really big defect, and you can see the other findings. Let me make this bigger. If you look at the caption there, they said, pericardial discontinuity, no surgical repair was performed at the time of injury as tamponade physiology was unlikely to occur in such a large defect. And I found this article after I saw the one I just showed you. So apparently sometimes that decision is made that the pericardial defect is so large that it doesn't constrict the heart which is interesting. But I know, David, uh, you shared one once before, and um, this is my second case. Right. This is dramatic. Yeah. I, I, I wouldn't think you could you could leave it. This is almost the um, fallen viscera sign here, isn't it? I mean, that yeah. heart is way rotated. Yeah, yeah. This is one of the other ones in the article, and the small arrows, which you may have difficulty seeing, here, kind of points to the constriction where the heart comes out of the pericardium, and he has a little narrowing of a pulmonary vein and so on. But they decided that his hypotension was maybe due to some myocardial contusion, and at some point they decided it wasn't a problem anymore and they were just going to leave it alone, which they did. Discharged him with that. <laughs> so that was interesting. Let me show you. Ah, this one's great. All right, so let me show you two images close together. I'm going to um, withhold some information for the moment. Well, actually, maybe I'll give you some. So this person over here, looking at this previous radiograph, uh, this person has a history of drug abuse. You can see that the tricuspid valve has been replaced, and it was replaced because of infective endocarditis. So the timing here is that's a comparison from 15, and this is the one now. And I really like this one because... This is a super nice example of the so-called PALA sign, P-A-L-L-A. -L -L so this portion of the pulmonary artery, this descending portion of the pulmonary artery is really dilated. And that's a new finding compared to the previous. So I called that and said that it's consistent with distension of that pulmonary artery because I knew the ultrasound examination showed large vegetations on the leaflets of this prosthetic tricuspid valve, I said it's probably because the vegetations have embolized. So 
here's the CT showing you the filling defects and why that pulmonary artery is so big. And there are lots of defects there. And here, playing this, I think, at least looking over here, there's some floppy vegetations on that tricuspid valve. So I'm pretty certain in my mind that this is embolization of the tricuspid leaflet vegetations into the pulmonary arteries on the right side, producing a really nice pala sign, so-called, on that radiograph. So, Howard, the, the vegetations must have been massive, though, to create this, this size of clot. Yeah. Um, Sorry. Yep. I believe they, they were described as large. I think, I think I'm seeing some of them flopping around here. Yeah, these things are really big, right? I don't know. Maybe there's some, some of the vegetations and some clot around them. I don't really know. Mm -hmm. But I, they didn't follow this person up with additional imaging. And because they recognized this as being a dilemma, but she was not compliant, the surgeons didn't really want to go back and, and deal with this valve again. So I think she was just discharged. On the at the time of the CT, I don't see big vegetations there that I can see in there. But I think that's what what that stuff is. I don't know that she had a DVT or anything else that could account for that. And it's all on the right side, and I don't know why. And um, was there an earlier CT that showed the vegetations? Could you see any filling defects on? On CT around the the TVR, or was it just a Wall Street card? Not, I do not have a previous CT. Okay. So the prior event was sometime in 2015. Yeah. yeah. I mean, that's a stellar example of the of that Palestine. There was a case in JTI recently, and it wasn't at all as good as this case. Um, yeah, they published the little um, the signs one. Yeah, this one's really nice. Really yeah. big fat guy. All right. The, um, that, raises, that raises the question again about how much of that is in situ thrombus from the vegetation. I agree that you know it's probably from the valve, but you wonder just if that creates a prothrombotic environment, and so you get mixture of vegetation because there's so much stuff there and thrombus. Yeah. Combination, perhaps. Yeah, I think that. I, I, yeah. Yeah. I think that's maybe plausible because there's a lot in there. More than just yeah. vegetations, I agree for sure. I, I missed I missed a, a, a minute of this discussion. So, what is the sign you're describing there? Yeah, it, just uh, the enlargement of the pulmonary artery. Pallas sign. In, I thought that was called the Fleischner sign way back when. Uh, yeah, so I don't know why Pallas it, tried this, but you know, the Fleischner sign is distension of that hilar pulmonary artery or the hilum. But someone decided that when the the descending pulmonary artery here, as opposed to the whole thing, the descending artery, the interlobar and descending is this distended like a sausage. Pala described that, and someone called it a pala sign. Okay. It's so this, it's, we're this, talking about the same thing, yeah. pretty much. Yeah, pretty much, exactly. Yeah. I don't know if it really needs to have a new name for it, because it's the same thing. Yeah. Or if it needs to have any name at all. Yeah. This is an ultimate retrospective sign. Publish or perish, guys. Yeah, yeah. I was, you know, I don't know. I, I was kind of proud of myself. I said, yeah. patient, no, I, I, when I read the ultrasound, I said, this is undoubtedly distension of the pulmonary artery with embolic material. <laughs> yeah, no, that's, no. That is a cute case. I'm impressed. Yeah, that's pretty big, isn't it? Great. Thanks, everyone, for great cases. I have more. We'll show some more next week. Welcome back. All right. Take care. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye.